Hallelujah, hallelujah. With your hands lifted up, why don't you just tell him, Lord, let your spirit fall down on me. Mm. Yes, 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 yes. Send now your spirit upon us, O God, we pray. In the name of Jesus, let the Holy Ghost fall in the room. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We wait on the demonstration. We wait on the outpouring. We wait on your touch. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. With my hands lifted up and my mouth filled with praise with a heart of Thanksgiving, oh, I will bless thee, oh, mm, with my hands lifted up, yeah, 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 and my mouth filled with praise, with a heart of thanksgiving. have sickness in my body but I'm gonna bless you anyhow may have some bills that haven't been able to pay but I'm gonna bless you anyhow mm. all things may not be as I desire but I'm gonna bless you anyhow bless the Lord oh my soul all that is within me, bless his holy name. Thank you, Lord. Yes, yes, yes. Hallelujah. With a heart of thanksgiving. Oh, bless the Lord. Give the Lord a hand of praise and you may be seated. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Psalmist said, I'll bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Mm. Mm. Hallelujah. Mm. 
With a heart of thanksgiving 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 difficult for some people to understand why we do this every time we come to church. <laughs> if, 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 if something would happen and I were to lose my memory, I wouldn't be here praising him. But the psalmist said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And, and when I think of the goodness of Jesus and what he's done for me, I, I can't help it. My, my soul cries out. Hallelujah. Oh, I just have to thank him for saving me. Take your seat if you can. Thank you, Lord. 
Why? Because he's been so he's been so good. Oh, he's been so. I don't know about you, but I know he has been to me. Open your Bibles with me to the Acts of the Apostles in chapter 10. There is one verse that we want to focus upon. gets like that sometimes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> In Acts chapter 10, verse 44, it simply states, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. I want to talk to you today about the power of the word. power of the word. God bless you, ushers. Hallelujah. Well, Peter spake these words. While he spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. I would submit to you that you could receive the Holy Ghost healing, deliverance from oppression, salvation for your family, and any other desired blessing if you would just hear the word. There are many present here today who can tell you that their entire life has been turned around as a result of hearing God's word. Well, the beginning of the universe testifies to the power of God's word. I know that science teaches that the universe began with a big bang. I have no problem with that theory. I also believe that the universe began with a big bang. I can even tell you what the Big Bang was. It's right there in Genesis chapter 1. Let me read it to you. Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the waters, was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. So the Big Bang was the voice of the creator saying, let there be. <laughs> and everything that was brought into existence. First, there was the initial Big Bang. And then there were the reverberating bangs, the aftershocks. <laughs> The voice of God 
that created the world and all things that are therein. Well, I think this thought is advanced by the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Hebrews as he expounded on faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. The word of God is creative. The Holy Bible is a living testimony to the power of the word. I say a living testimony because the Apostle Paul does tell us uh, that the, the word of God is quick and the word quick means alive. The word of God is alive and powerful. So he says in Hebrews 11, 1 through 3, uh, well, uh, that the uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it, the elders obtained a good report through faith. We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So the things which are seen are not made of things which do appear. And then we also can see that the word of God, the Holy Bible, is a living testimony, a continuous living testimony of the power of the word. At the banks of the Red Sea, Moses spoke the word which God had commanded him to speak. We always focus on Moses stretching out the rod. And we speak about uh, this miracle stick. Uh, we would do well to remember that God said something prior to Moses stretching forth the rod. In Exodus chapter 14, verses 15 and 16, And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. But lift up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry land through the midst of the sea. All we look at most of the time is Moses stretched out the rod. But we forget God told him, first of all, speak to the children of Israel and tell them what? Go forward. It was really the word of God, even though the sea was in front. And if God says, go forward, something's got to happen to the sea. Either there's got to automatically become a bridge, or uh, else he's going to do what he did, cut a highway in the middle of it and send the wind to blow out the trail. If God says it, whatever he says, you can believe it. Even as Jesus told his disciples in the New Testament, uh, when they had finished uh, feeding the hungry multitude, and he got into the ship and said, let us go over to the other side. Now, he knew a storm was going to rise. He knew the wind was going to blow. He knew the waters were going to dash into the boat. He knew that the disciples were going to get frustrated and that they were going to get tired. But his word was... We're going over to the other side. And you got to understand that when you have a word from the Lord, it does not matter about the opposition that comes, the difficulties that arise, and how it seems like what God said is not going to happen. But if he told you you're going to the other side, there's not a wind, there's not a wave, there is absolutely nothing that can stop you from going where the Lord said you must go. Uh, let me move on a little further. The power of the word was demonstrated through Joshua when he was in the heat of his battle against the Amorites. Joshua chapter 10, verses 12 through 14. Then spake Joshua to the Lord. Now listen at this one. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed 
until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemy. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. For the Lord fought for Israel. Joshua spoke to the Lord and told him to hold the sun and hold the moon. And God honored what he said. I'm trying to tell you, you can get in the midst of some situations. And if you can find a way to relate it to what God has done and is doing in his word, you can see things happen in your life that you never dreamed were possible. We spend so much of our time trying to emulate and imitate somebody else. Always trying to, you know, I want to pray like Sister Do Funny. I, I want to dance like Brother Governor. I want to talk in tongues like so-and-so. No, you need to get into God's word and say, I want to have faith so that I can speak with power and with authority. Uh, let me move on here. The power of the word was demonstrated through the prophet Elijah. In the days of Ahab and Jezebel, 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1, and Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. Ahab and Jezebel had led the nation into idolatry, and God put it into the power of the prophet to bring the nation to repentance. And God's going to have to put the word in somebody's mouth to bring this nation to repentance. Because whether you know it or not, America is on a collision course with God's divine judgment. Uh, you cannot go against those things that God has said within his word. Uh, you, you cannot shut the door on the God that made this nation what it is. Uh, you, you can't legislate and you can't have judges in the Supreme Court that put the word of God, the Bible, and put prayer and put the Ten Commandments and put everything righteous outside of the walls of any kind of institution that receives governmental funds and then turn around when God has said that he made them male and female, and when he has said man shall not lie with man as with womankind, and then you turn around and institutionalize same-sex marriage. Anytime a nation is on collision course with God's word, the word says the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. And if God does not, Put the power in somebody's word, in somebody's mouth to speak words that congressmen understand. Oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. Because now you've got U.S. congressmen and you've got U.S. senators uh, that rather than try to come up with a constitutional amendment to strengthen the laws of God, they are out there pushing that our society would embrace the homosexual lifestyle. And the tragedy of it is those of us shouting and dancing and speaking in tongues are going to the polls to keep those same folk in office. It doesn't matter how good a friend you may be to me. It doesn't matter what political party you are in. When you are voting your nation into a collision with the judgment of God, I'm sorry. You can't have my vote. I think I just lost somebody. I'm sorry, but I'm going to tell the truth anyhow. <laughs> the 
this was not only an Old Testament truth, but a New Testament reality. The Roman centurion recognized the power of the word when his servant was sick. Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 10. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them, that followed. Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith, no, not in Israel. I, I haven't found that kind of faith among the folk who are supposed to be the people of God. And sometimes the other folk who don't supposed to have the knowledge of God that we have, they can look into the things of God in a way that we are not able. Here was a Roman centurion but he had evidently read the Old Testament. He had evidently been keeping up with the actions of Jesus. And when Jesus uh, agreed, uh, another passage talks about the fact that there were leaders of the Jewish people that interceded for this centurion and said that he's worthy that you should do this for him. So Jesus was willing to go to the centurion's house and heal his servant. But the man said, you don't have to do that. I'm not worthy for you to come inside of my house. But all that you need to do is speak the word. If you just say it, my servant will live. Tell you what, because I'm a man under authority. I know what my word does when I speak to the 100 soldiers that are under my control. They have to obey because they know that I'm backed by the power of Rome. And when you speak, you are backed by the power of heaven. And if you speak the word, my servant will live. And I want you to know you've got to get that kind of confidence in the word of God. Oh, I know most of us, we like to shout and praise God after we see it. But God wants us to have the kind of faith in his word where we can rejoice even before we see it just knowing that it has been spoken. Let me move on here, and I'm almost finished. When Jesus was surrounded by a crowd, what did he do? He proclaimed the word. We love to go to Mark chapter 2 and talk about them tearing the roof off of the house and letting that man who was sick of the palsy down uh, from the roof in front of Jesus. But the chapter does not start with the man being delivered. It starts by saying in verse 1 and 2, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days. And it was noise that he, Jesus, was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door. And what did Jesus do? He preached the word unto them. Jesus instituted the power of the word as the believer's privilege. Mark 11, verse 22 and 23. If I'm moving too fast for you, get the tape. <laughs> and Jesus answering said unto them, Have faith in God. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, I wish you'd tell somebody, you got to learn how to say it. <laughs> uh, don't, don't just stand there hoping and wishing. And, and I just imagine that if this would happen, you're going to have to have enough faith to speak that thing you believe. How many times have I explained it, that even your salvation is not only based on what you believe. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness, but with what? The mouth confession is made under salvation. You got a lot of folks sitting around talking about what I believe in their heart. 
but it's not enough just to believe it. You got to have enough faith to put yourself out on that limb and say what you believe. Jesus said that if, if, if you can say, if you say to this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. See, you got to speak to the mountain. A lot of times we speak to one another. We tell one another about that person on the job. Oh, they just give me the blues. I tell you such and such a person on my job, they, they, just, they just do this and they do that. No, you got to learn how to speak to the mountain. You got to have enough faith to speak to that person and let them know I love you in spite of. It doesn't matter what you're trying to do, I love you anyhow. Uh, but I'm not going to get bent out of shape every time you work your little trick. I'm not going to get upset every time you run to the boss and tell a lie on me. Sometimes you got to look at the mountain and speak to the mountain. Sometimes you got to look at the mountain, that mountain of bills. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. You got to speak even to that mountain of sickness, illness and disease and infirmity and quit talking about I'm going to die with this. No, you got to speak to that mountain and say by his stripes, I am healed. You got to have enough faith to not only believe it, but you got to say what you believe. Touch somebody and tell them you got to learn how to speak the word. Even if that problem looks like a mountain, speak to the mountain. Glory to God. Well, why is there so much power in the word? Somebody said, well, what is the word? I'm convinced that the power comes from the reality of who the word is. Not what the word is. John 1 and 1 says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. And if I keep on reading in John chapter 1, I'll come to verse 14. Where it says, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. Now the word has become personified. Not just writing on paper. But the word embodied in flesh. God so loving the world that his own word, oh my God, became wrapped up in human flesh, born, conceived in the womb of Mary, and born in the little town of Bethlehem. And there's something about the power that's in the word because everything that's in God is in his son. And everything that's in his son is in his word. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. And you need to learn how to stop confessing doubt and start confessing his word. This is why the Holy Ghost failed in the house of Cornelius. Because when you go back to that 10th chapter, and I'm going to be finished in a few minutes, verse 38 was one of the key verses in the sermon of Peter in the house of Cornelius. Peter responded to the call of Cornelius. Cornelius, if you read that entire 10th chapter, he was a Roman centurion, but he was a devout praying man. And one day, while he was fasting, he got a visit from an angel, and that angel stood in his room and told him that your prayers and your alms deeds have come up as a memorial before God. But the thing that you are concerned about now, the angel couldn't do it. The angel could only tell him where he could get a preacher. See, the thing about God, God honors that which he himself has put in place. Angels are his ministering spirits. But he doesn't send an angel to preach to you on Sunday. Because if he sent an angel to preach to you, by the time he finished, there wouldn't be nobody in here. 
So he has committed this treasure of the gospel in the earthen vessels. So the angel told Cornelius where he could get a preacher. Send the Joppa. There's one there by the name of Simon Peter living in the house with another man named Simon whose occupation is tanning hides. He's a tanner. But you get Simon Peter and he will come and tell you what you need to do. In the meantime, Peter, who was a devout Jew, he was devout in his faith. He also was somewhat bigoted because he didn't want to go down to those Gentiles. You still got a lot of folk like that. They're so holy, but they can't mix with nobody but their own. But I tell you, this thing of salvation and the gift of the Holy Ghost is universal. It doesn't matter who you are. If you're going to be saved, you got to be saved through the name of Jesus Christ. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under the heavens given among men whereby we must be saved. And if I'm saved, hallelujah, I know it's not reserved to the black man. It's not reserved to the white man. It's not reserved to the Puerto Ricans. It's not reserved to the Russians. But one Christ with a universal message for all mankind. So God had to get Peter ready. Peter was hungry. See, God can deal with you when you fast. And on the day of Pentecost, I don't want you all to eat until after church. I want you to stay where God can talk to you. Peter went up on the housetop, fell into a trance, saw something, a vessel as it were, looked like a sheep let down from heaven, knitted on the four corners. And God, I heard my dad say years ago, he looked like took Peter to the first motion picture show. Uh, because he's sitting there in a trance and he's looking at a sheep let down from heaven and on it all kind of four-footed beasts, creeping things, all kind of animals and he's hungry and a voice is saying, Arise, Peter, kill and eat. And he looked and said, Uh-uh, I can't eat this. He evidently saw swine and he knew he couldn't eat any kind of pork. Yeah, he also saw a delicacy that we love today, you know, shrimp and lobster. But he couldn't eat that because God had said to them, whatsoever is in the sea that has fins and scales, not that stuff that's got shells, but fins and scales. They couldn't even eat catfish because while the catfish has fins, it doesn't have any scales. So he's saying, I can't eat any of this stuff. Because it's common, it's unclean. And the Lord said, what I've cleansed, don't you call it common. He was breaking down the middle wall of petition. And I want you to know that since God broke down the middle wall of petition, the greatest sin that is committed, especially in America, the most segregated hour of the whole week is Sunday morning when black folk can't worship with nobody but black folk. White folk can't worship with nobody but white folk. The Lord said, I've torn down the middle wall of petition. It's not a matter of ethnicity. It's not a matter of what particular race you are of. For out of one blood, God created all nations of men to dwell upon the face of the earth. Hallelujah. And if your salvation won't let you reach out to folk because they are different color. You don't have the real thing. The Holy Ghost that fell on the day of Pentecost was a universal Holy Ghost. God had to work on Peter. Told him that three men are coming to see you and I want you to go with them. Under any other circumstances, when they found out that a Roman centurion had sent for him, Peter would have never gone. But God got him ready. So when the Lord got through getting him ready, and he went to Cornelius' house, and when he walked in the door, Cornelius, being a centurion, he evidently had a big mansion, a place big enough 
for him to call together his hundred soldiers, call together his family and friends. And as soon as Peter walked in, he said, we have all gathered to hear what the Lord has commanded us of thee. And Peter goes into the message kind of informally. The word I say you know, uh, which began back there in, in Judea and, and how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost. And he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. And he just began to relate some stories about Jesus. They are not recorded. We don't have the entire sermon. But while he was talking about Jesus, and I want you to know that the Holy Ghost does not honor all of this other stuff. I know God wants us to prosper and be in health, but you don't get a Holy Ghost outpour when you're talking about money coming to me. You, you don't get a Holy Ghost outpour when you are into the realm of positive thinking. But if you want the Holy Ghost to come in, you got to center your mind on Jesus. When he stopped talking about Jesus that was born of the Virgin Mary, when he talked about Jesus, the man that God had put so much power in his hand that anybody he touched would be healed, that he could spit in a blind eye and the eye come open, that he could whisper in a deaf ear and simply say, Epiphah, and the deaf ear would pop open. Walk into the bedroom of a sick and dying girl. In fact, she had already died. And caught her by the hand and said, Tell us a kuma. Damsel, I say arise. And the spirit entered back into that girl. Talked about a Jesus that met a woman on the way to the cemetery to bury her son. And he just hit the coffin. And the boy jumped up. Talked about a Jesus that stepped to the entrance of the burying place of Lazarus. He'd been dead four days. His body had begun to decay. And all he did was call him by his name. And when he said, Lazarus, the spirit of Lazarus came from the other side, got back into his body, and Lazarus walked out. He talked about a Jesus that hung on the cross, died until even the sun blacked out. Buried in Joseph's new tomb, three days later, walked out of the grave, saying, I'm he that liveth, was dead, but behold, I'm alive forevermore, and got the key of death and hell. And while he spoke these words, while he spoke the word, the Holy Ghost, fell in the room all over the place men and women began to speak with other tongues while he spoke the word they were filled with the Holy Ghost and I I want you to know whatever's going on in your life hear the word sorrowful. His word is healing for the sick. His word is deliverance for the oppressed.
to start praising him. He's ready to feel somebody. He's out there healing somebody. He's out there delivering somebody. Give him glory. Give him praise. Open your mouth and bless his name.
for your word. Thank you for the 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 word. They heard the word and received the Holy Ghost. We thank you for your word. And we thank you for the Holy Ghost. We thank you for your word. And we thank you for the Holy Ghost. Come on, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your word. We heard the word. And we thank you for the word. We thank you for the word. We thank you for your 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 word. Thank you. And we will go receiving the Holy Ghost. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for restoration. If there are persons in the room who are not saved, you can come now while the waters are troubled. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for strength. Thank you. Thank you. If you've come to be saved, we want you to follow our elder. If you've come to be saved, they will further instruct you in the designated place. The rest of you on the altar. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you for the word. The word gives life. We thank you for the word. We thank you for the word. Thank you for the word. We thank you for the word. Uh-huh. We thank you for the word. The Holy Ghost is in the room. I want you to return to your seats receiving the Holy Ghost. The Spirit of the Lord is all over this house. It's not just at the altar. Those of you on the altar, return to your seats praising the Lord. Return to your seats praising the Lord. Return to your seats praising the Lord. Is this going to be like two weeks ago? I ask you in the name of Jesus, if you can, find your seat. If you go back to your seat. Thank you, Jesus. We have another service tonight, and we want all of you to return. That's why we're trying to move expeditiously. We're not cutting off the anointing. We'll finish this tonight. Thank you, Jesus. We don't want you to spin yourself and not return at 6 o'clock. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. The Holy Ghost is real. He'll baptize you in your car. He'll baptize you in a restaurant. We don't have to have you at the altar. He'll fill you anywhere. Thank you, Jesus. You'll have to leave your desk tomorrow and go in the bathroom. He'll fill you at work. You have to hold your mouth and leave your desk because you'll feel your language changing. He'll fill you anywhere you're ready to receive him. He can fill you while we're lifting an offering. He can fill you while the orchestra, while the strings are playing. Thank you, Jesus. Gospel music doesn't have to be playing for him to fill you. Whenever you're ready, you get hungry enough, you open your mouth and, and he'll fill your mouth and he'll change your language. We don't have to clap over you. Thank you, Jesus. The power of the Lord is in our leader today. Thank you, Jesus. 
to lay hands for healing. It cost, oh, my, 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 my. He preached the word, and you received the Holy Ghost like he said, by hearing the word. God anointed him with power today to speak healing to the people. And we thank God for his strength. Thank God for the anointing. Thank you, Jesus. Those of you who came after the offering, we want you to elevate your hands so you can receive an envelope to pay your tithes.